Hi there, welcome to the skeletal muscle simulation. Here you will learn about the different types of muscle fibers found in skeletal muscles, and how we can differentiate them from one another using histochemistry staining. You will also use a force transducer to figure out the effect of different stimuli on muscles. Let's start by meeting some competitive friends at the campus park. Get ready for fast travel. Phew, I go for long runs all the time, but I had to sprint fast to keep up to storm and then my legs started hurting. As soon as I started walking, the pain disappeared. That seems pretty weird to me. It's almost like you have two types of muscles in your legs. Is that even possible? This would be interesting to check out in your lab. Great idea Dominique. Let's teleport back to the lab to learn about the different types of muscle fibers that could be in play here. Find the lockers and open one of them. Find a lab coat inside the locker and pick it up. Well done. Now find a glove box and click on it to put some gloves on. Go to the lab by clicking on the doors. Hi, I'm Dr. One. I saw how perplexed you and your friends were about the different muscles for running and walking. Today, discovering the difference begins with dissecting rat muscles for the experiment. A rat has been sedated for you to dissect at the hollow table. Pick up the scalpel to begin. Click on the rat with the scalpel. The leg has many muscles. Today we are focusing on two muscles with different fiber compositions, one that has slow twitch fibers and one that has fast twitch fibers. Specifically, one of the muscles is called the soleus and the other is called the EDL, or extensor digitorum longus. Click on the rat leg to open the leg for the muscle dissection. Click on the rat leg again to remove the skin and fat. This will expose the muscles below. First, you'll dissect the soleus, a muscle located at the back of the leg, and part of the commonly called calf muscle. You use the soleus for maintaining posture. Click on the rat leg to remove the soleus muscle. The other muscle is called the EDL or extensor digitorum longus and is located at the front of the leg. This is a common muscle to study because of its ideal geometry. Click on the leg to dissect out the EDL. Great job! Put down the scalpel to continue. To determine the fiber composition of each muscle, you can dye muscle components and organelles using chemicals. This is called histochemistry. Afterwards, you can distinguish the different types of muscles under a microscope. This only works with very thin slices of muscle tissue, about 12 micrometers thick. You'll need a cryostat to cut a muscle slice this thin. Luckily, we have one in the lab. Go to the cryostat to cut a slice from each of the two muscles. Place the muscle in the cryostat. Click on the handle on the right side, to start slicing the sample. Nice slices. You can find them on slides just to the left in the cryostat. Click on the slides to pick up your thin slices, also called thin sections. We now need to use a pre-incubation solution. The 9.4 PHATP solution will have to incubate for 15 minutes before the sample is ready to die. During this time, let's practice how to analyze the different histochemistry assays. Histochemistry involves an enzymatic reaction in which the product precipitates and the colored precipitate can be seen through a microscope. Go to the microscope workbench to analyze some previous results. Today we will focus on three histochemistry assays, 1. The myosin ATPase assay for slow or fast twitch fibers 2. The SDH assay for oxidative potential 3. The AGPDH assay for glycolytic potential. The muscle you can see on the microscope screen was dyed for myosin ATPase and a darker stain indicates a higher capacity to use ATP. This means muscles can contract more quickly and can be considered fast twitch. Which of the three cells can be considered fast twitch? Well done! Both 2 and 3 are darker due to them containing more of the enzyme myosin ATPase. Another assay, the SDH assay, uses nitro-blue tetrazoleum to test for the presence of SDH in mitochondria. 
This gives oxidative cells with many mitochondria a pretty purple speckled appearance and non-oxidative muscle fibers will be paler and more sparsely speckled. Of the three cells on the microscope screen, which have the potential to be more oxidative? Great work, of course the two more intensely stained cells have more SDH and therefore, higher potential to be more oxidative. Finally, the AGPDH assay tests for an enzyme that transports NADH, one of the products of glycolysis, into the mitochondria. When muscles have insufficient oxygen, they generate ATP through glycolysis. In this case, lots of NADH is moved into the mitochondria. These highly glycolytic fibers show up darker. Using this information, which of the three cells on the microscope screen have a high capacity for anaerobic activity? That's right, those two cells are the more glycolytic ones. This means they work well under anaerobic activities and can produce more lactic acid from glycolysis. There are three types of muscles. Type 1 is slow twitching fiber, type 2A is fast oxidative muscle fibers, and type 2B are more glycolytic. The myosin ATPase stained fast fibers, AGDPH stain the glycolytic organelles and SDH stain the oxidative cells. Now it's time to put these three assays together. Looking at the table, what type of fiber is cell 1? That's right, cell 1 is slow and oxidative. It's stained lightly using myosin ATPase which means it is slow twitch. It was dark when stained for SDH in mitochondria meaning it is oxidative. The AGDPH didn't stain much, so we know it's not very glycolytic. Looking at the table, what type of fiber is cell 2? Correct. Cell 2 stains strongly for all three protocols. This means it is fast twitch, contains some mitochondria and is functional under anaerobic conditions. Finally, looking at the table, what type of fiber is cell 3? You've got this. Cell 3 stain for both myosin ATPase and AGDPH, meaning it can convert ATP, and work under anaerobic conditions well. However, it didn't stain much for SDH, meaning there are fewer mitochondria and it is non-oxidative. Great! Now that you know how to analyze the assays, it's time to do some myosin ATPase staining of the soleus and EDL muscles you dissected and turned into thin sections. Click on the fume hood to go there. The sodium hydroxide has been added to the first solution and is incubating for 15 minutes. The pH of all necessary solutions have been set for you. One thing to keep in mind is that the ammonium sulfide must be yellow. If it turns red with age due to oxidation then it is ruined as a reagent. Time's up. Pour the pH 9.4 ATP onto the slides in the staining dish. This has to incubate for 25 minutes to allow for the formation of phosphate. The slides must then be washed with calcium chloride three times. Wait for 25 short minutes. Pour the staining dish solution out into the beaker. Put the staining dish back onto the workbench. Wash the slides with calcium chloride and then pour it into the beaker when you are done. I've done the last two washes for you. Now that the sample has been cleared of the ATP solution, we can add cobalt chloride. It needs to incubate for 10 minutes in order to produce a good dark color that we can see using a light microscope. Add cobalt chloride to the slides in the staining dish. 10 minutes have passed so you can pour out the cobalt chloride. Now we want to wash with sodium barbital 3 to 5 times each. You just do the first round, then I'll do the rest. Wash the samples once with sodium barbital. I've finished the 5 washes. Now it's time for a final wash series in distilled water. You do it once, and then I will complete another 4 times. Click on the bottle of distilled water to wash the slides. I finished the water washes for you. This next step is toxic, so I have turned on the fume hood for you. You can see a yellow solution of ammonium sulfide prepared for you. 
You need to add the solution to the jar for 20 to 30 seconds, after which the color will change. Then, wash it with water. You do it the first time, and I will do the remaining times. Use a pipette to add ammonium sulfide to the samples. Pour out the ammonium sulfide. Now, wash the slides with water. Awesome! You are finished with the staining portion and ready to place your slides on the rack. Click on the lab pad for more information. Now we need to get rid of the water to create a dry and permanently fixed slide that won't be degraded by oxygenation or bacterial contamination. This is accomplished with an alcohol dilution series from 50% to 100%, and then xylene. Be careful these liquids are highly flammable. Use a pipette to pick up the first solution for the dehydration. I have completed the remaining alcohol dehydration steps. Don't you wish you had a drone for a lab assistant in real life too? Last step of the series. Use a pipette to add xylene to the samples. Finally, we are at the last step before we can look at the two tissue samples under the microscope. You have dissected, sectioned, stained and washed these muscles. The last step is mounting the slides with Canada balsam, which is a sticky glue with optical properties like glass. Slides prepared this way can last more than 100 years. Use a pipette to add the Canada balsam to the slides. This was only one of the histochemistry assays we discussed earlier that allow you to look at the differences between the soleus and EDL muscles. The other two protocols have already been completed for you. Go to the microscope workbench to analyze all the results. Each of the six slides on the workbench contains a beautifully stained slice of either EDL or soleus muscle tissue. Take a look. Click on each slide. Then click on a stain cell on the screen to record the results. Remember the three types of muscles? Type 1 is slow twitching fiber, type 2A is fast oxidative muscle fibers, and type 2B are more glycolytic. This bar chart summarizes the percentages of each type of muscle fiber in the EDL and soleus muscles. Can you work out what each muscle is best at? Based solely on the fiber types that you've found within these muscles, which muscle seems to be more suited to slower, sustained movements like walking? That's it. The soleus stains strongly using the SDH staining, meaning it's filled with mitochondria, which are used for aerobic work. The EDL on the other hand is great for anaerobic and fast movements, like sprinting. It is time to test the responses of the muscles to different stimuli. First, you need a new set of muscles. You have collected a new fast twitch EDL muscle. Now collect the slow twitch soleus muscle. Now that you have both muscles, it is time to attach these to a force transducer. Go to the force transduce. Click on the EDL water bath to place the EDL muscle. Click on the soleus water bath to place the soleus muscle. On the middle screen you will find the interface for both force transducers. 
The data will then be logged on the two peripheral screens. When you stimulate the muscles, the twitches will be recorded on the screen. Then you will stretch the muscle 1 mm and the twitches will be recorded again. You will repeat this until you see a decrease in force. This will help you find the optimal muscle length. Click on the pulse button to shock the muscles. You can click on the EDL and soleus buttons on the control panel to toggle between the data for each. Click the extend button on the control panel to extend the muscles by 1 mm. Now click on the pulse button to shock the muscles again. Seems like stretching the muscles allows for a bit more force to be exerted on them. Repeat these steps until the twitch force decreases 3 times. Click on the pulse button. Toggle between EDL and soleus on the control panel to compare the two muscles. Click on the extend button to increase the muscle length. Click on the pulse button to shock the muscles. Click on the extend button to increase the muscle length. Click on the pulse button to shock the muscles. Click on the extend button. Click on the pulse button. Notice how the two muscle types respond differently to being stretched and shocked. Remember to toggle between the two datasets by clicking on the EDL and soleus buttons. Click on the extend button. Click on the pulse button. Click on the extend button. Click on the pulse button. Awesome! You've reached the point where you want to stop extending the soleus so you don't overextend the muscle. You can see the decreasing force on the soleus trace. Under the extend button, use the arrows to change the extension from both to EDL. Then, click extend. Under the pulse button, use the arrows to set the shock to L for left to only stimulate the EDL. Click the pulse button to stimulate the EDL muscle. Click on the extend button to extend the EDL by 1 mm. Click the pulse button to shock the EDL. From the graphs you have made that are visible on the center screen, how does passive tension change with muscle length? That's right. As you just saw the passive tension of the muscle increases when the muscle is extended, just like a rubber band. How does active twitch tension change with muscle length? That's right. When the muscle is shorter or longer than its optimal length it will not perform as well. Now you know how the length of a muscle affects its performance. It's time for some twitch kinetics. Similar to before, we will stimulate the muscle with an electric shock. The muscle reaction will be recorded on the screen, then you will indicate where we can find the time to peak, and half relaxation time. Click on the pulse button to shock the muscles. On the EDL graph x-axis, click the time that represents where the twitch starts. Click on the x-axis where the twitch peaks. Great, this is where to look for the time to peak. You can notice that the two muscles have different times to peak as well as different amplitudes of force. The last measurement to take away from these graphs is the half relaxation time. On the EDL graph x-axis, click the time that represents where the twitch is at half relaxation. Time to collect the same data for the soleus muscle. Click on the x-axis of the soleus graph to indicate the time when the twitch begins. Click on the x-axis of the soleus graph to indicate the time when the twitch peaks. Click on the x-axis of the soleus graph to indicate the half relaxation time. The half relaxation time is the time of decay from the peak of muscle tension to one half. This is affected by the muscle's sarcoplasmic reticulum which is in charge of moving calcium ions over the membrane of the muscle cells. The duration of muscle contraction is impacted by the speed the sarcoplasmic reticulum can pump the calcium ions out of the cell. Comparing the two graphs, which of the following could possibly explain the faster contraction and relaxation speeds of the EDL relative to the soleus? Exactly. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is indeed more abundant in the EDL than in the soleus. Here's another way to compare the data, by recording the seconds required for, time to peak, or TTP and, half relaxation time, or HRT. Notice how much faster the EDL muscle is at reaching peak.
In summary, with a single twitch, the EDL generates a lot more force than the soleus. Let's figure out if this remains true if we stimulate the muscles many times quickly. This is called tetanus kinetics, when a muscle sustains contraction for a period of time. The first thing we need to do is set the frequency of the stimulations, let's set it for 40 Hz. This means the muscles would be shocked 40 times per second. Click the pulse button to shock both muscles at this frequency. Take a look at the graphs. Why might the EDL generate a higher force during a single twitch, but the two muscles generate similar forces when stimulated at 40 Hz? Amazing! The soleus releases calcium to the cytoplasm and pumps it back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum more slowly than the EDL during a twitch, but at 40 Hz, enough calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to achieve much higher forces. Here is a summary of the tetanic forces. It's easy to see that the muscles have very different time to peaks, and the slower twitch soleus also takes a longer time to reach half relaxation. You get to have some fun now setting the frequency of the apparatus to a variety of frequencies and seeing the effect on the muscles. Use the arrows to set the shock to L for left so it only stimulates the EDL muscle. Set the first frequency to 5 Hz. Click on the pulse button to shock the EDL muscle. Set the frequency to 10 Hz. Click on the pulse button to shock the EDL muscle. Set the frequency to 15 Hz. Click on the pulse button to shock the EDL muscle. Set the frequency to 20 Hz. Since I'm your virtual lab assistant, I'll do the rest for you. Would you like to collect the data for the soleus muscle yourself or would you like me to do it? Let me just give you a helping hand and finish this shocking session. The soleus tetanus peaks are fused, which means that they do not completely relax before peaking again. Why might the soleus show fused tetanus peaks and higher forces at a lower stimulation frequency than the EDL? Great work! Yes, the fused tetanus peaks are caused by calcium ions remaining inside the fibers of the soleus. The EDL is faster at getting rid of the calcium ions which then prevents tetanus at the same low stimulation frequencies. You can compare the forces of the two muscles when stimulated at different frequencies on this graph. Awesome job! That was a lot to learn about muscle stimulation. I think I'm too tired to continue with the fatigue experiments. Fatigue experiments are about patience. You will stimulate the muscles until they reach 50% of their initial force. Set the shock to L for left, using the control panel. Set the frequency to 40 Hz using the control panel. Click the pulse on off button to shock the EDL muscle. Time to stop shocking. I've turned off the pulse for you. Now, let's do the same with the soleus. Set the shock to R for right, using the control panel. Click the on off button to shock the muscle. Let me speed up the time on this one. I will stop the run when we've reached 50% of the muscle's initial force. You can observe the data as it appears on the screens. Why might the EDL fatigue more quickly than the soleus? Fantastic! The EDL is as you know, faster, but it uses anaerobic metabolism to achieve these speeds, causing it to tire earlier than the soleus. Turns out the fatigue experiment was not so tiring after all. I think you have everything you need to explain why walking and running use different muscles to your friends. The fastest way is through the back door behind the microscopy workbench. Click on it to go there. You're back. Awesome. I'm looking forward to hearing about the different types of muscles in our legs. So, what you are telling us is that when I am going on long slow jogs or walks, I am using my type 1 slow twitch fibers. And the soleus has more of this type. Interesting. And since I'm more of a sprinter, I use my type 2 fast twitch muscles more often but for shorter duration. This is like how the EDL relies mostly on anaerobic metabolism and tires faster than the soleus. Well, Storm, with this new knowledge, I challenge you to a twitch off around the entire lake. On your marks, get set, go. Congratulations, you have completed the simulation. We hope you enjoyed it and you feel wiser now.